uh, application scientist. He is, has a PhD in chemical and process engineer from the University of, how do you say that, Strathclyde? It's, it's, it's a Scottish. It's a Scottish, so yes. I'm pretty sure they just make up as they go. Uh, I would rather have you guys read his bio than me really speak about it. <clears throat> More important. And um, here is the clicker. I call him the, the, in the, side, the clicker in Boston. You didn't say with the Boston accent. Clicker. Just on the clicker. Okay, so uh, as Fernando said, um, I'm giving the talk based on uh, measurements of nucleation rates um, using induction time uh, measurements. Um, this is, again, something that's quite new for technologists. It's something that we've developed using our instruments in the past, but it's now something we've been able to incorporate into the uh, new instrument. So what I'm going to do is just start briefly on the basic understanding of crystallization, um, looking at nucleation theory specifically, so the two different um, competing theories of nucleation and how they sort of, kind of balance each other. Specifically looking at um, the induction time measurements um, and how that can be used to then determine the nucleation rate um, with a case study of uh, dipropylene, which is an antihistamine. Um, and then I'll be showing just briefly a crystal 16 v 3 worked example, so how the instrument itself can be used to measure the nucleation rate. Um, and then um, secondary nucleation, which is also a very important one, particularly when you're looking at seeding um, and industrial processes. So, as we probably all know, crystallization is a very complex process. There's multiple different factors and um, elements that are competing against each other and can influence each other um, in ways you might not uh, originally think. And this can be you know, down to just the chemistry, so functional groups, the solvent system, how they interact with each other. Um, any case of additives or impurities can have significant differences on solubility or kinetics and thermodynamics. Uh, the thermodynamics of the system, so temperature, pressure, any additional phases, whether there's boiling out that can occur, uh, secondary morph uh, polymorphs that happen, all of these obviously play in. And the process of working at smaller scale has, can sometimes have completely different results than moving up into you know, pilot plant or even 100 milliliter scale, um, just because the level of control is a lot less um, when you go up in scale. So how do you address and investigate this complexity? And that comes from you know, understanding the full landscape of the crystallization process. Um, but in order to do that, you need to do like a large number of experiments, which means it needs to be cheap to run. You can't be doing you know, 100 experiments, which are costing a thousand dollars or euros a pop. Um, they need to be accurate, robust. You know, they need to be reproducible every time. They need to be easy to perform. So benefits of crystallization, again, it's probably well known by most people in the room, is um, solid form control. So you're able to produce the solid, the preferred solid form you're wanting. Um, this can be done through seeding protocols or you know, very strict controls of either temperature profiles or anti solvent profiles. Particle shape, shape and size influence. So again, by changing cooling rates and anti solvent profiles, or even use the uh, use of additives, you can control you know, which maybe surfaces are growing or which maybe aren't, or if you want to enhance the nucleation more. Um, increased purity, so purging impurities. It's very some cases where there's been impurities which have been uh, unable to be purged through the chemistry. You need to do a certain chemical step in order to do this as a byproduct. Through a controlled crystallization or use of salts or co-crystals, you're able to you know, remove and get rid of those impurities, which is no other way of getting um, away. Um, as well as a controlled crystallization is necessary for your manufacturing, as well as your legal filings on that compound. So if you are you know, wanting to start producing material, you need to be able to show to your regulator, we are going to produce the same thing every time. If you're producing tons of material, you're not going to test every time. You need to you know, do several small tests and that will prove that you've been making the same thing every time. So crystallization is actually made up of several aspects. So nucleation, which is the formation of new crystals from solution. Uh, growth, so this is growing on the existing uh, nuclei surfaces. To, Particles, agglomeration, so this is um, sticking of particles together, 
And then foul language is similar to agglomeration. This is where you sort of stick the two uh, surfaces, and these can be impellers, glass walls, and that sort of uh, stuff like that. So with nucleation, there's several types. Um, so you start with your uh, secondary nucleation. So this can be done. This is induced by uh, the introduction of seed material, of existing crystalline material. Um, this is typically done through uh, seeding crystallizations. You then have uh, primary nucleation, and this can be again separated into two different types. You have heterogeneous, and this is introduced. This is induced by uh, foreign particles. This can be something as simple as dust that somehow got into a reactor. There was a, uh, a single crystal paper where a fly had got into their reactor, and it's nucleated on the fly. Therefore, that it acted as your heterogeneous particle. Um, and then homo uh, homogeneous, which is nucleation from a purely clear solution, so entirely spontaneous nucleation. Um, so the nucleation theory, so the study of nucleation is you know, undertaken to understand how crystals have been formed. By greater understanding of how crystals are formed, we can then start to implement you know, controls and uh, ways of influencing it to give us the desired results. Um, but the um, you know understanding of nucleation isn't there's not a, there's not a unified theory. There's different you know, people with different ideas about how nucleation occurs. And the two primarily the biggest ones uh, primarily are um, a, you know, a classical nucleation theory, which is going through the individual monomers. These then uh, you know, aggregate into a sort of a cluster of radius. This nucleus, and if it's large enough, is then able to or reorganize and become a crystal. The second is the non-classical nucleation or two-step nucleation theory. And this is where you go from monomers and then they sit in this cluster which is actually metastable. So these can exist um, in solution without nucleating for very extended periods of time. And if, you know, after a certain amount of energy is uh, reached, then eventually a nucleus forms within inside that cluster and then it reorganizes into a crystal. So classical nucleation theory was originally um, derived based on observations about uh, vapor droplets forming uh, liquid within vapor um, by the scientists here. And it can be expressed by the um, Gibbs free energy of the entire system. And essentially what you have is an interplay of two different energy forces. Um, first, you have the uh, interfacial energy. So this is the energy required to generate new surfaces. Um, and actually, this is the in, this is the negative driver for uh, inhibitor for nucleation. And then you have your second, which is the volume energy. So this is you know, the energy released when um, new, uh, molecules incorporated into the into the uh, radius, um, and that's the energy released. And essentially, what you have is until uh, the you know, volume energy is able to overcome the interfacial, any uh, you know, nucleus that has a radius below this. Will just collapse back into its smaller form and then be dispersed back into solution. However, once you reach the point where the Gibbs free energy then becomes uh, favorable, the volume is overcome the interfacial energy, you get a successful um, uh, nucleus forming, which then becomes a crystal over time. Um, the second, which is non classical nucleation theory, and this is based on um, observations in uh, proteins. And this, uh, you know, this again, looking at the energy the diagram here, you have the initial energy barrier to becoming liquid white clusters, and, um, and then you have a second energy drop, which is going from the, uh, the clusters that sit inside this well in order to then become crystal nuclei afterwards. Um, and the good thing about this one is you can actually physically see these. So these are taken on um, nanosites. So what you're doing is essentially is shining a uh, laser light through a sample, and these can be super saturated or even saturated. The light then refracts off, um, so, sorry, it scatters off these sort of more dense clusters. If you can see, there might be some slightly just haloing, and that's the hydrodynamic radius of these clusters that surround the center. Um, these can also be measured by DLS, and this has been shown that even if you then filter these and remove them, the actual nucleation rate decreases uh, within those systems. Um, as well as you can see these um, by small angles of X-ray scattering. So there's been several papers on this that have shown that. So measurements of primary nucleation is actually quite difficult. Um, 
because mutation is stochastic, it's random. It can happen anywhere between a fixed time of uh, once supersaturation is generated to, uh, you know, depending on the system, can be several weeks. Um, so you also need to very tightly control the temperature because this is closely related to your supersaturation. Um, another uh, hurdle to this is that crystal nucleus is obviously very tiny, they're only you know, one to a thousand micrometers in size. So you can't actually see these with any uh, current analytics, uh, but at least you know, as you're going through the crystallization process. So typically you're measuring what happens after the nucleation has occurred. Um, so you sort of get this entanglement of nucleation, growth, and agglomeration, all these secondary factors are coming into each other, and you're sort of like interweaved into this mess of trying to derive individual components uh, about the uh, nucleation rate and growth and all these uh, So a method was developed by um, Dr. Horst using the Crystal 16 version 2 that made use of the um, induction time measurements using the uh, motility uh, sensor in order to you know, determine uh, in stuff about the mediation rate. Um, there's a lot of math. I'm not going to go entirely into it because I'm not a big fan of that amount of math. But the important one to maybe look at is N, which is the um, average number of nuclei formed in a system um, within a time frame, which is then you know, defined as the remediation rate of J, the volume that you're then measuring within, uh, and then the time frame of measuring. So the number of crystals formed in a volume over a period of time. Um, so if you look at um, the equation here, so we have the probability of uh, one or more nuclei being formed is equal to one minus the probability of no, no nuclei being formed. And then because of the equation here, you can expand that to give you as part of J. Using the, uh, taking into account obviously the delay between nucleation and when crystals are actually observed, that growth period, you can incorporate that into the equation. So now your uh, Tj here, your measurement time, can be expanded into T, which is your induction between when crystals are formed, and Tg, which is your growth time before they actually grow visible, so nucleation uh, growth time. And then, you know, probability is ultimately defined as, you know, if something's going to happen, so it's the number of successful crystallizations or nuclei being formed, um, divided by the total number of experiments that have been conducted. Uh, and if you have any, anyone wants to look up the math of a better explanation than I gave, I'm more than happy to give you the paper on this. Um, we have a white paper on this method as well coming up. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, so what ultimately does that mean? So what we can do is we can temperature cycle between dissolving us, um, our suspension and then cooling that back down to a given supersaturation to then induce crystallization. We can measure the time between when the supersaturation is first reached and then when the crystals are first detected. And then that gives us our induction time here. We can then do a number of experiments. We can look at the spread of the induction times across a whole range of data. And then plotting that as the probability of var crystallizing by time t against time. We then create a cumulative probability distribution. And then that could be rearranged by fitting a line, giving J the mutation rate. Uh, there is an important question that was brought up, and this was um, quite uh, well put by uh, Tom Svetter out of the University of uh, Manchester as part of Roger Davies' group. So, if it, mutation is a stochastic process, if I only take 20 data points, have I fully captured the randomness of this process? You know, if I take 40, have I fully captured? How many data points do I need to have? in order to make sure I've fully caught the broad spectrum of the, um, the randomness that's gone on, um, you know, introducing uncertainty into my uh, calculated nucleation. So what he did uh, was he took various data sizes, you know, 20, 80, 160, and 400 experiment, uh, data sets, um, plotted their induction times, and as you can see there's quite a broad uh, distribution in the fittings of the, of the data. Um, but what he found is, you know, once you hit 80 experiments, the nucleation rate is actually quite well aligned with even going higher. Obviously, the more data point is going to give you a more accurate reading, but you know, 80 experiments, 
can take you weeks, depending on how easily something crystallizes. So do you really want to be sitting there taking 400 measurements when you just do not have the time to be taking that? Well, it's over the conclusion you said, uh, under these circumstances, data volume shows 80 or more reduction time should be measured for real experiments. You can also set the growth time, so you know, between uh, when, you, when you first get your first uh, mutation point. It's not very clear on here, but this is sort of tiny point here. Basically, between zero and when your first new uh, crystal is detected, you can define that as Tg, assuming that something is crystallized or nucleated as soon as supersaturation has been reached. So, um, what I want to do is just go for a worked example. So, uh, initially, what you have to do is collect your solubility curve. This is because you need to obviously determine what supersaturation you're using and how you're defining that. So supersaturation is defined as concentration divided by the solubility concentration at a given temperature. Um, so if I take 25 degrees C here, if I sit just inside, I want to try and aim inside this metastable zone because once I go past here, then it's spontaneous nucleation. It's going to happen very quickly and it's most likely going to occur during the cool down. So it's not a very accurate point to try and uh, measure. Um, so I just created a bunch of uh, supersaturation ratios here. Obviously, maybe 1.4 out of this is the only one that we can actually measure. Um, and it's actually recommended to do maybe just an overnight cycle of heating up, dissolving, and then crashing down and holding it overnight just to see how long that induction time is going to be. Too high supersaturation is going to crash out during the cool down, which means the data is not going to be useful. And too long, you could be spending a month trying to collect one data set, which is um, impractical. So they did um, temperature cycles for 80. Um, this is the diprofilene in two different solvents, in various different supersaturations, um, and then bits of the data report. Um, so from this, what you can see in the IPA, the mutation rate suddenly jumps, going from 1.2 to 2 uh, supersaturation, from uh, just 100 up to about 430. Um, in the DMF, there isn't such a giant leap, but there's still a gradual increase as expected as you increase supersaturation. Well, there's an interesting comparison, though, is if you take 3.0 in IPA in the same supersaturation in DMF, there's a very big difference, almost like 20 times difference between the calculated uh, nucleation rate in the two solvents. So you can probe that a bit further. And this is um, being able to use the calculated nucleation rate of J to calculate two um, factors. So you can calculate A and B from this. So A is the kinetic factor, so how fast the nucleation is going to occur. And then B is the thermodynamic factor, so this is whether the nucleation occurs at all. Um, you can take J with supersaturation equals the kinetic factor times supersaturation uh, exponential V over. Uh, natural log 2 of S, put into a straight line graph, and you're then able to extrapolate uh, A and B. And you can see is actually the kinetic factors are fairly close, so there's no kinetic uh, influence about whether nucleation is going to occur. But there's a massive difference in B, so the thermodynamics between the two different solvents are very different. Um, and as they took uh, seeding with, material, with, a, uh, with a single crystal, Calcul you know, count calculated the suspension density here against time, now it changes. Um, so, because the same supersaturation, just seeding with different size crystals. Um, so, with small crystals, you have very low secondary nucleation rate. Uh, as you've got larger, the secondary nucleation rate increases greatly. And using this sort of information, you are then able to determine control the level of secondary nucleation. So if I want to grow very small particles, I want to have you know, quite a lot of surface areas so or a high secondary nucleation rate that's going to eat up all that supersaturation across a large number of surfaces. If I want to do you know, very large crystals, I want the low secondary nucleation rate so there's now fewer surfaces and it's going to grow affect more on the growth of those existing surfaces rather than trying to create new ones. Um, so I think I've probably gone quite quickly. I'm happy to take any questions um, on this.